Well, last week we looked at how we were created to worship. That was part one. And today I'm going to continue with this whole theme of worship in part two. And so this topic of worship is huge. And if God's people would only get it, I mean really, really get what it means and what it is to truly worship, it would change the church, it would change our world. The church today would be revolutionized. It would truly bring revival if we would just understand what worship really is and how we've been created to worship God. But let's review last week very briefly. We began last week that worship is responding to God's love. You see, because God takes the initiative. He always takes the first act. He takes the first move. God loves us and God loves you, each and every one. And God has proven that love to us in Jesus Christ. In John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God makes the first move. Worship is responding to that love of God. Secondly, worship is reciprocating God's love. We looked at that last week, how God gives life to us. And we, in turn, are to give our lives back to God. He is our creator. He is our maker. He made us to have relationship with him. And so as he gives us life, he desires, he doesn't force us, he, but he desires and he wants us to give our life back to him. And that is worshiping him. And then we look thirdly that worship is not only responding to God's love and reciprocating God's love, but it's expressing your love to God. Expressing your love to God. And we looked at Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. You see, you can, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. You express your love to God by giving God that which he wants most, and that's you. He wants your life to be given to him. So that was last week's message. And that was the condensed version of part one. So let's move forward today as we look at this huge topic of worship and how we've been created to worship so moving forward, worship is also focusing our attention on God, focus, uh, focusing my attention on God. It's focusing my mind, my thoughts, all my attention on God. You see, God wants us to worship him thoughtfully, and to do that, it takes energy. It takes getting our mind focused on God. There's so much to distract us, isn't there? We live in a world with so many distractions. This is a big problem. And so it's not just going through the motions, but really, really thinking about it, which isn't easy to do, to think and focus on God, focus our attention on Him. Now, have you ever prayed on autopilot? Have you ever zoned out in church? It can happen to us from time to time, doesn't it? Our mind wanders. But you know why God wants you to focus? You know why he wants you to focus? God wants your focus because he's focused on you. He's focused on you. Look at what the psalmist records for us in Psalm 139. You have looked deep into my heart, Lord, and you know all about me. You know when I'm resting or when I'm working. You notice everything I do and everywhere I go. You see, God has focused his attention upon each of us. Did you know that God pays constant attention to you? That he never takes his eyes off of you? And that he never stops thinking about you? He never stops loving you. And the reason is, he made you to love you. 
And that's why his focus is upon you. He loves you. And he made you to give you this kind of attention. And the greatest expression of love is giving someone your attention, isn't it? Isn't that the greatest expression of love, giving someone your attention? Give a child your attention and they'll be all over you. I know that when our two children were young and we would have visitors come to the home, I would know within seconds, within seconds, by how the children reacted to our guest as to whether that guest was focusing at all on the children. And you see, even as adults, we know this very quickly. When someone is giving you their attention or not, they may be there in body, but not in spirit. And children have a, a, a way of really finding this quickly. And so we, 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 we need to remember our, well, do you remember your first love? That first person that you fell in love with when you were a young person? That constant focus and thought that you had towards that person? It was an infatuation, I'm sure, and sometimes infatuations wear off. But God in the Bible, it tells us that his love for us, for you and me, is eternal. It is forever. And he's always focused on us, and he always wants to teach us to focus our heart and attention to him as well in return. Now that's difficult at times, I know. It's difficult to focus on God for the easiest thing to do in life for us as human beings is to lose our focus because of all the distractions. We're not like any of those autofocus cameras that you might have. You point at something and it focuses and puts it into focus for you. We have to decide to focus as human beings. We have to choose the things that we're going to focus on, that we pay attention to, that we look to. So how do we do that? How do we put our focus upon God? Well, first of all, you have to realize, first of all, that we are easily distracted. But there are two things that distract us most, I believe, from focusing our attention on God. And the first is that we are self-centered by nature. That we are self-centered by nature. By nature, we want the focus to be on me. Look at me. Listen to me. Hear what I have to say. Look how important I am. Look at what the things that I desire, that I want. We are self-centered by nature. This is the whole issue with children and growing up, is to learn not to be so self-centered. Because when we are very self-centered, no one else around us likes or perhaps finds it easy to get along with us. So not only is that a problem for us in focusing towards God, this self-centered by nature that we are, but we also, secondly, live in a self-centered culture. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Do we ever live in a self-centered culture? Much of the social media today, I'm afraid, is about look at me. Look how important I am. Look at all my pictures. Look at all the things that I'm doing. We want to share that with everyone out there. And we want to have thousands of friends. Because we live in a self-centered culture. And this is a big problem for God's people. Romans 8, 7 says... Focusing on yourself is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God and ends up thinking more about self than God. And again in Romans 12, 2, the first part, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You see, my friends, this is what God is calling us to do, is to look away from self, look away from the world and the culture of the world and look to God for everything. We must choose 
Choose to stop thinking about some things and start thinking about God and start focusing upon God. We have to choose and purposefully fix our attention on God because Satan, who is the enemy of God and his people, works very hard at distracting us to be self-centered. He will draw us back. He will, he will draw our attention to ourselves. So as we start thinking about God and as we focus on God, we need to ask ourselves, with all the self-centeredness and the enemy pounding at our door to distract us, how do we really focus on God? Well, I suggest to you very simply something that we have talked about many times is to start just by establishing a time with God every day. For Jesus showed us the way. He always did it very early in the morning. It's not the only time, but it's a good time. Before the day starts, before the distractions of the world and of daily grind of life comes upon you, it's good to be up early and to come before the Lord early and spend some time with Him to start your day off on the right foot, to get focused on God right off the beginning. But do you realize how difficult it is to spend some time, even a little bit of time with God every day? Again, because Satan will try to, to distract you. And things of the world will crowd in on you. Who do you think is doing everything in their power to keep you from time with God? You know who that is. But if you want to start to focus your life on God, you have to start establishing some time with God where you listen to him, where you read his word. You try to hear what he's saying to you through his word that he's given to us. You share your life somewhat with God in those moments. And you take time to listen quietly. Just a few minutes of each day. It doesn't matter when, but that you at least begin to give God more time than you're giving him already. And I know for many people it's not a lot. Especially if you still have children in the home. It's difficult to do. But I know that if you will, if you will only give him that part of your day, some of it, he will help you with the rest of it. Matthew 6.6 6. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can, can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. Notice three specific words in that text that I want to highlight. Place, simply, and honestly. You see, place. Find a place where you can focus on God. Where is that place for you in, the, in, in your day? Some place where you can find some quietness and, and not be disturbed. Where is that place? You find it. There is a place. It may not be perfect, but it'll be better than most other places. Find that place that you can go in your day. And then simply, just be with God simply. Don't get sophisticated. Don't worry about making a great, great big plan and, and working it all out. Just simply come before God. Quiet yourself. No ceremony, no fancy words. You're just there with him to converse with him, to talk with him. Have your Bible there. Read what God has already spoken to us as a people. And then thirdly, honestly, just be yourself. You don't have to have some deep voice to talk to God as you hear some people when they begin to pray. Just be who you are. Just be who he made you. Don't try to be spiritual. Just be you. And you will be spiritual. And being spiritual doesn't work anyways because the truth is you don't have to try to look spiritual. You just have to try to get to know God better. And he'll take care of the making you look spiritual side of things. Yes. So you just be there with him honestly. Establishing a time with God is a wonderful way 
to begin to focus your life more on God. And if you already have some time that you are daily doing with God, then I challenge you to make it to be even more time. As you mature, as you grow, you will understand that the more you spend with God, the more you'll be able to cope with life. I guarantee it. It works in my life. It'll work in your life because that's what God has made us for, to be with him in order to face life. And the second thing that I believe you could do to focus on God, that is to develop a constant conversation with God. As you walk through life, all through the day, be conversing with him all the time. Be mindful of him all the time. The psalmist said in Psalm 105, verse 4, worship him continually. And you can worship him continually if you are mindful of him continually. Just think about God throughout the day, in the little things, in the everyday things. Every time you get into your vehicle, whenever you open your wallet, when you get up, whenever, think about God, think of his blessings, think of his goodness. Ask him to help you, ask him to be with you. Ask him to show you what you should be doing, what you should be paying attention to as you go through your day. Even the mundane things of washing the dishes, of getting a meal ready. Whatever it is you're doing, be mindful of God. And as you do this, focusing on God, it will have incredible benefits in your life. And Isaiah 26.3 gives a glimpse of one of the benefits that you will have as you focus your life more and more on God. You will keep, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. You see, we live in a world of turmoil. We live in a world of tribulation. We live in a world with a lot of problems. But if you are focusing on God, and if you are spending time and mindful of Him, with Him, the benefit is that he will keep you in perfect peace as you trust in him, as you focus on him, you'll be at peace even in the midst of all that's going on around you. You see, when you focus on yourself, when you focus on me, the inevitable result are thoughts of worry, thoughts of insecurity, anxiety and guilt and fear and discouragement as you focus and you turn in. But as you turn out and you look towards God, as the focus shifts from you to God, all of a sudden you will begin to sense gratitude. You will begin to sense hope. Hope because you know that God can and that you will be confident You'll have a confidence and a love because God is sharing, begins to share his life with you. He begins to pour himself out into you. This is worship. This is true worship. And so out of those two scenarios of focusing in or focusing out and the results of each, which do you prefer? Which makes more sense to you? Worship is focusing my attention on God. Secondly, worship is using my abilities for God. Using our abilities for God. This is loving God with all your strength, with all that you are. You see, God wants us to see him with our minds. He wants us to sense him with our heart and soul. And he wants us to serve him with our strength. The strength that he has given you, the abilities that he has given you, the understanding and the knowledge and the wisdom that he has given you. You see, now, I've been married long enough, long enough to know that it takes more than just words and kisses to express affection. Yes, Brenda likes me to tell her I love you. And I try to tell her that every day. And she likes me to express affection physically. But there's another kind of love that is needed as well. To back it up with, ex with practical expressions of love. You see, because around the house, in my relationship with my wife, sometimes there are chores that need to be done. Sometimes there are things that need to be fixed. Sometimes there are errands that need to be run. 
Sometimes there are responsibilities that need to be shared. And those are the practical things where I give of my time, I give of my ability to show that it's not just words. I really love you. But I'm going to show you by what I'm also going to do for you and with you. It's both. You need the words. I love you. But you back it up with what you do. That's what a relationship is all about. Practical things. Fixing, helping, serving, sharing. Those kind of things. And that's part of worship as well. Colossians 3.23. Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. As though you were working for the Lord and not for people. Wow. Did you hear that? As though you were working for the Lord and not for people. And so if you get this verse, it will absolutely revolutionize your life. Because people can be pretty miserable sometimes. People are not very friendly sometimes. People are not very thankful sometimes. But do it as unto the Lord. You'll never be the same once you understand this. You see, in life, it's not what you do that matters. It's who you do it for that matters. And as God's people, all that we do need to be done for him with all our heart, with all our strength, with all our might. You see, many people come compartmentalize their lives saying, okay, here's my worship, God. This is where I worship you. I go to church once a week. And maybe I have a daily time. I spend some time with you every day. And that, that, that's my worship. And then over here, I've, I've got my career. And, and over here, I've got my social life. I've got my family and my extended family and friends. But worship is here, or maybe over here a little bit. But they're, they're different. And I hear God say, no, no. God says, I want you to invite me into every area of your life. I want you to worship me in all that you do. I want to be involved in all of it. Invite me into the whole thing. I want to be your very life. And so let me say it again. In life, it's not so much what you do that matters. It's who you do it for that matters. And the world is doing it for self, most of all, and not for God. And we who are God's people need to get this right, that everything we do is for God, because everything we are comes from God. And a lot of people get hung up, and they go, what is God's will for my life? I don't know what God wants for me to do. Should I do this or should I do that? And I believe, I truly believe, that God's response to us as a people when we approach him that way is, I hear God say, I don't care, it beats me, whatever you want to do. Because I wired you in a certain way to have some certain interests. Why don't you do the things that you're interested in doing, doing and do it for me? You see, God doesn't care whether you're a truck driver, an attorney, or a factory worker, or a nurse, or retired. Whatever it is that you're doing and involved in, you serve him, you do it unto him. God wants to know whatever you're doing. Are you doing it for him? And that makes a whole world of difference in your life. I guarantee it. And this brings us to our final point. In that worship is being dead to self and yet alive to God. Worship is being dead to self and alive to God. Romans 12, 1. Because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God. 
dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. See, the Apostle Paul is speaking here and God is speaking to, through him to you and I today and throughout all generations. He's appealing or urging Christians in their life to live it as a living sacrifice. As a living sacrifice. Now, in the Old Testament, you'll find many sacrifices being offered to God. They offered many sacrifices to God. Whatever was offered had to be the best of quality it had to be without any blemish or defect. It would be slain and burned. It involved the cost to that person making the sacrifice. And although the sacrifice would be dead, Paul is using this picture of a sacrifice, but he tells us that we are to be a living sacrifice. Dead, yet alive. Dead, yet alive. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. The Apostle Paul speaking here says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, living in me. Dead, and yet alive, because Christ is living in you. You see, it's no longer our life. We are to be dead to our life, to self. We are to be crucified in Christ and alive now for Christ because he's living in us. His spirit has invaded our life now. And we are to let him to have control of this life. This is what worship is truly all about. No longer our life. We are dead to our self-life, crucified yet alive for Christ, living in us as a living sacrifice, died to everything that is you, especially the old you before Christ came into your life. So now you place your all on the altar and you give your life to God. And it's going to be costly. It's going to really cost because it's self. And that hits close to home. But when you come to that place and realize it's the least that you can do for what God in Christ has done for you, I tell you, I tell you, because of the finished work of Christ at Calvary, the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, has come to dwell in us and will give us a new life, a new way of seeing the world, a new way of relating to the world. Because the very life of Christ will become our life. It's no longer your life. It is Christ to be living in and through you. By God's mercies to forgive us and receive us into a relationship with him, we live our lives for God and to God. And in the book of Revelation, he, there's that picture where he's knocking at the door where he wants to come in and he wants to have a meal with us. You see, there's nothing more intimate than having a meal with someone. And that's why during this COVID, we've hated it so much we can't get together with people to have a meal together, to eat together, because that is a very intimate way of having fellowship. And that's the kind of fellowship that the Lord Jesus wants to have with you and I, an intimate meal kind of relationship. Worship involves also to be holy to be a holy people and acceptable to God. You see, this is the alive part. We're dead to self, but we're to be alive. And part of the alive is Christ living his life through us, us listening to him, obeying him, and allowing him to change us and mold us and fashioning us into a very special object to be used by God, holy and set apart for his use, his purpose. Not our use, our purpose anymore. We are completely set apart for God, dedicated to living for him. 
This is a big deal. This is a big thing. It's the biggest thing that God's people can understand and grasp and allow. Him to have your life. That's what makes us holy and acceptable as we dedicate ourselves exclusively to God and for his use. And he'll begin to take away that sin in our life and he begins to change the bad things in our life and the things that we do wrong and how we act and behave. Will we be perfect in this world? No, but we better be changing, becoming more like him. We will as we allow him to take over in our life. He will change us. It's putting God first with how we live. It's living our lives for God in moral purity. Not living like the world is living, not watching what the world is watching, not listening to what the world is listening to, not speaking as the world speaks, without the anger, without, without the all, look at me and what, how I've been offended. Believing that God is your life, that he is with you, that he will see you through. It's a sacrifice. This is the most reasonable service to live for God rather than ourselves. And when we do that, his peace comes into our life. And his love will come into our life. And his peace and his love will flow out of our life. And our life will be different. And I also guarantee it will be better. And this, folks, is where the rubber meets the road. You see, real worship doesn't just happen in church. It doesn't even just happen at a prayer meeting. It doesn't even just happen in your personal time of quiet time with God every day. Or even when you read your Bible. All those things are important. But you see, real worship, if you haven't got it yet, if you haven't grasped it yet, happens in the ordinary, routine, mundane things of real life as you live it moment by moment going through your day. God, I'm taking out the garbage for you. <laughs> yes. You see, you can make beds to the glory of God. You can milk a cow to the glory of God. You can clean your garage to the glory of God. And I know some of you ought to be cleaning out your garages. <laughs> and so when you do it, do it for the glory of God. Everything can be turned into an act of worship. Again, Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, putting all your heart and soul into it as though you were working for the Lord and not for people. And so now, what if you decided to say this? What if you decided to say, God, tomorrow morning, I'm to, uh, going to get up and wake up to a new boss. Everything from I do, Lord, from here on in, I'm going to do it for you and not for me. You're my boss. You're my Lord. You are my God. What will happen if you would do that? If you would turn, give the reins and control of your life completely and wholly to God, what will happen? I'll tell you what will happen. It will turn the mundane and the trivial uh, things that don't seem to mean a whole lot in your life would we'll turn it all into worship. Because God will be very pleased as all you do in all of your life is for him. And honestly, that's the kind of worship that God loves. God wants from us the kind of worship in which we say, God, whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it for you. And when you do that, then your life becomes an act of worship. You see, real worship is a lifestyle. And God created you to worship him. And the truth is, everyone is worshiping something because you were wired by God to worship. He put it in our DNA. You couldn't stop worshiping if you had to because it's part of being human being. Everyone worships something. And that's why you can go to any culture in the world to find people worshiping. 
And if you don't worship God, if you do not worship the living God who created all that exists, if you do not worship God, believe me, you're going to find a substitute very quickly, even if it's just yourself to worship. So let me ask you, what are you worshiping? What are you worshiping? I'll tell you what it is. It's whatever you're giving your primary attention to. Whatever you're giving your primary affection to and whatever you're giving your primary abilities to, that is what you are worshiping. And for some of you, it may be your work. For some of you, it may be making money. It may be, for some of you, it may be pleasure. For some of you, it may be retirement. It may be family. While all of these are important, the problem is when they become more important than God, then you're not worshiping God. When anything is more important in your life than God, chances are that is what you are worshiping. And so let me tell you something. Let me tell you that the greatest temptation of your life and the worst sin that you could possibly commit is a temptation to worship something other than God. You say, but that's not my problem. And I say, oh, yes, it is. It is your problem, too. It's the number one problem in, the, in, in anyone's life because it is the root behind every other problem. Whenever you love something more than God, you're going to have chaos. You're going to have conflict. You're going to have stress and problems always when you worship something other than God. When I love comfort more than doing the right thing, I always will get into trouble. When I love protecting my ego more than God and humility, I'm going to go down the wrong path. And when I love my reputation, when I love money, when I love pleasure, when I love family, when I love anything, you can name it more than God, it will create all kinds of havoc and challenges in your life. So let me ask you again, what are you worshiping? What do you think about the most? Because whatever you think about the most is what you love the most. And whatever you think about when you just let your mind drift, where does it go? You let it wander. What does it naturally gravitate towards? And whatever that is, I tell you, is what you're worshiping. You may think you're worshiping God, but you're not. If he is not on your mind more than anything else. Did you know that your checkbook and your calendar are theological documents? Without even knowing you, if I didn't know you, if you were to show me how you spend your money and how you spend your time, I could tell you what you are worshiping. Because the way you spend your time and the way you spend your money shows what you love the most. You see, you were made to know and love God and to worship him with all your life, with all that you are. And so I challenge you, I challenge you to make as the number one goal in your life before anything else, get to know God and love God and live for God. Get to know him, love him, and live for him in all you do. Because that's what you were created to do. Worship God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I know that we all fall short. I know that this is a very big subject, but I believe it is so important that it is a message for the age today. If God's people would grasp why you made them and what they're here for, worship you, their lives and the life of the church and the life of our world would ever be turned upside down. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your salvation. Yes, you saved us, 
but you more than saved us. You desire a relationship with us. And in that relationship, we will worship you. And we will look to you and we will trust you and acknowledge you and live for you in all that we do. We don't work for other people. We work for you. And we're not living for other people. We're living for you because you are God. And help us to get that. And may our lives be ever different from this day forward, if not already, Lord, and, and each one listening in, that we're going to live for you and make you the most important thing in our lives. Oh, there's many other things, and we love them all, but we're going to love you more, more than anything, oh God, because that's why you made us. Bless these, your people. Forgive us. Help us to get it right. Be with us now and forever, God, I pray in Jesus' name.